Hey folks, Randy Newberg here. Thanks for watching this episode from season nine of Fresh Tracks. Did you know that our Fresh Tracks Plus platform now has a free option? Yeah, if you go over there, you can watch this episode and a few others ad free. And those of you who are paid subscribers, you already know, you can get a lot of exclusive content there. You get early access to content. You get invited to our exclusive live streams. And some of you even win an hour of FaceTime with me where we can plan your hunt. Go check out freshtracks.tv at the link below. It's fascinating to me to be right here and think about how interesting this kind of habitat is and how interesting these deer are. These Sitka blacktail are so different. There's some, some incredibly complex relationships between these deer and this habitat. They are so different. God, that's amazing. Unbelievable. So if we didn't have deer, I mean, all of this is manicured by deer. This brush would be eight, 10 foot tall if there wasn't deer on the landscape. Mm -hmm. I started about 15 years ago, started a, a North American mule deer black tailed deer genetic study. And it was important to sample the Sitka blacktails in Southeast Alaska. Somebody said, you know, you need to get a hold of Jim Bachel. He might be able to help you get some tissue samples. We, we found we both had an interest in deer hunting and the Pleistocene period and how important this area was in the whole realm of deer evolution and, and populating of North and South America. And I kept saying, Jim, you ought to come up here and, and hunt these deer and see what they're like in their landscape. So the deer here on Central Prince of Wales are just going into the chasing phase. So the does don't want to have anything to do with them and the bucks think they ought to. And uh, the does have just come off of some kind of about a three week lockdown. They allow their fawns to still kind of be with them, but they're no longer nursing. They've all been totally weaned. So there's a family group. And the, fawn, the does then will not as aggressively run in to protect the fawn when you do a fawn in distress bleed, but they'll still come in. So I usually give a really loud first call. I try to get them up out of their bed mm -hmm. and then get them coming to that thing. And the idea is if there's a buck tending them, he sees them running, he thinks, oh good. And, he, and then he'll smoke right in behind him. out and they're moving and they're foraging and feeding like all the deer were around my house this morning in this mm -hmm. rainy weather. Oh yeah. If it's warm and sunny, they go lock up in the timber somewhere. <laughs> I love these deer. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Sick of blacktail gods. <laughs> All right, educational moment. Taste that. And you tell me about sweet fat. Wildlife biologist guy. Wow. Mm. Not tallowy. Mm -mm, not at all. <laughs> because I had never eaten any fat that, on a deer that was good. Nope, not at all. Until I got up here and had these. Several years ago, I was talking to uh, Randy Newberg and Randy said, what's your, what's your number one bucket list? If you could hunt anything anywhere, what would you do? And I said, sit the black-tailed deer in Southeast Alaska, just because they're so fascinating and see the habitat and, and all of the habitat issues. Um, now to be able to spend a week walking through this habitat with someone like Jim that, that has the knowledge and can, can explain. We're not just walking around the woods looking for deer. We're explaining, we're thinking about these ecological relationships between the vegetation, between the soil, and between the hydrology. So this could be, if this was treated as a wildlife treatment, you come in and you remove some trees and you leave some trees and stuff like that and get some light in here, maybe a few patch openings and stuff like that. Yeah. It could become really good habitat and produce some second growth wood 
for a manufacturer. I mean, it's just tons of biomass hitting the ground. It's just tons it's of biomass. Of water too. Yep. I'm not a wildlife biologist, but I spent a lot of time volunteering and helping ADF and G put radio collars on and monitoring these deer. And I've gained a little bit of insight into the life cycle of Sitka blacktail in the landscape. The real key factor in their life is habitat where they can get food on a bad winter. And so winter range is like this key thing for these deer. They have to have some place to go. Because of past forest management um, and the scale of past forest management, we have so much landscape out there now that is not quality habitat. It's good thermal cover. Deer can get in there and get out of the snow, but there's no food. And so there's a huge opportunity for the forest uh, to be managed in a way to produce some wood and to really better that habitat for deer creating the openings to get some sunlight in there, to get some forage back in that landscape. So not only is it good thermal cover, that it actually has value for browse and stuff completely through the winter. Let's say we go find us a buck. Mm -hmm. getting hungry. Let's go back. Uh, there's an incredible piece of habitat that runs for three miles down there. We can make as long a day as we want or as short a day as we want back in there. And if it doesn't work this day, tomorrow you take me hunting. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> now we got a plan back here before it gets dark. We're going this way. Deer, over here. The strategy that I use is to get close to bedding areas. If you're in the muskeg complex like this, they might be small little knobs or hills or, or a little bit of benches or something like that, and then start calling and using a myriad of different kinds of calls and stuff to get them to come in. I really enjoy this kind of walking from opening muskeg to opening and then going down into a dark canyon and sitting and then walking up a canyon and to just keep exploring. It was really cool having Jim on the landscape. Uh, he's got a world of experience thinking about deer and deer habitat. To share this land and with somebody that fully appreciates every aspect about it, all the nuances and stuff, it makes my experience richer and it's just fun. So I found that after a shot, 
this gives you a moment to re to calm down because <laughs> you have plenty of time before you're going to shoot again. <laughs> We're going to walk up on this ridge and the deer are going to be as many as stars in the sky and a big buck is going to run out to Jim Heffelfinger and say, take me Jim, take me. Mm -hmm. This is the plan. All right, let's go have fun. Look at the deer tracks. Look at here. in the last 15 minutes than we did all day yesterday. So part of the calling strategy is, is waiting and being patient. And I'm not a patient person. I want to go to the next place. I want to see the next muskeg. I want to see what's over the next ridge. And you really, once you throw that pebble in the pond, once you start calling, you should stay there for 30 to 40 minutes. My perspective of hunting desert deer in the desert and then coming up here um, ha has produced some really interesting contrast. For one, I noticed that we sometimes will hunt water in the desert, of course, sit by water because that's something that's limited and the deer are going to be attracted to. You're not going to hunt water here because it's absolutely water everywhere. And you've got about 30 yards, your shot's going to be about 30 yards. And if a buck's come running in to the call, it, it's a quick shot. This is a really good hunt in um, August. Every one of these little knobs has got a couple bucks that lives on it. You can see these dead shore pine. That's previous year's rubs. So when you come on to a new muskeg, you can look out and you can kind of tell where the rub line is going to be by the previous dead shore pines. One of the reasons that I really wanted to get up here, not only as a lifelong deer hunter, I was certainly interested in hunting these deer, but, but my fascination really is seeing these deer in their own environment, looking at the kind of habitat that that they live in, look at what some of the issues are that make the habitat better, what some of the issues are that, that make the habitat a lot worse. So the idea was to try to get those does to bring their suitor in tow up to us, and it just wasn't working. We did call in one of the biggest four points that I've ever called in. Kill it. I can kill it. Jim, can I kill it? Yeah, go ahead. I can't see him. He was about that wide. He was really a big four point. 
Did you ever get eyes on him? Did you ever get eyes on him? He was never clear. He was that wide. But about that tall. He had big eye guards. <laughs> It was an amazing deer. Uh, it was uh, so cool to see that quality of an animal. Uh, I very seldom call in bucks of that quality. When the does come in, they come in hot and they come in close, really close. And they want to find out what is hurting that fawn. And a lot of times I can hold them there and call them back. Of course, the hope is that the longer you hold them there, that there really was somebody coming in behind them. <laughs> Anytime you're interacting with an animal and communicating with them in a way that causes them to come to you or do something like that. It's just, that's really rewarding. They come in so quiet. I saw that doe and then I saw another deer behind. And I thought it was a buck at first. And then I could see the size that it was a fawn. It's pretty awesome. Seeing that close. Hey folks, Randy Newberg here. Hope you're enjoying this episode from season nine of Fresh Tracks. It's been out on our Fresh Tracks Plus platform since we launched last September, and now we're launching season 10 over there. No matter where you watch us, whether it's on YouTube or whether you're one of our paid subscribers, we thank you. And if you want to check out Fresh Tracks Plus, I hope you go to the link below. It'll take you to freshtracks.tv. Whether you sign up for the free version over there or you sign up for the paid version, either way, we really appreciate it. About five million years ago, the earliest deer came into North America through Beringia or this Alaska connection. If you think about it, all of the different deer species in North and South America have an origin and have ancestors that that came through this area and have have used this area, and that that to me is really interesting. That was cool. Yeah. She was so pretty. One of the fascinating things with deer along the coastline is what's the story of how the deer moved and along those islands, you know, and how did they get out here and what was the timing of when they got out here? We've got quite a bit of evidence that it, it wasn't this kind of a forest, that it was a forest that had fire in the ecology and stuff, and, and they were coming into a much different environment that we have here today. If we can, if we can have as much luck tomorrow as we had today, and and just keep replicating this until it comes together, it'll happen. It, it, it's happening, and every day it's going to yes. be better and better and better. Yeah.
metapodial. Native Americans used to sharpen these because they have a really nice butt plate. Use it for awls. Useful tool. Uh, in 2011, we had a really big snow year. We lost something like 86% of fawns over the winter when they were in marginal habitat. And the, the winter persisted so long, they just starved to death. One bad winter can wipe out a huge percentage of the population in just a short period of time. Basically, these deer manage starvation from December until April. One thing that's fascinating is we're just deer hunters walking through the woods, but you walk by this big dark hole in the ground and you can't see the bottom at all. And, and these are the kind of caves that Jim and, and other people have been in exploring, mapping, and actually identified what bones were down there. There's a lot of deer bones down there. They've, they've had bear skulls down there. There are deer bones that have been recovered in the caves in Haida Gwaii, or what was previously known as the Queen Charlotte Islands south of us and they date up to about 11,000 years ago, and then deer disappear off of that island. And about 9,000 years ago, deer appear here, at least our oldest ones that we have are somewhere about 9,000 years ago. So this rainforest and stuff basically started about 6,000 years ago. And so before that, it was a much drier forest on the landscape. Some of those deer bones in some of these caves may provide a link to something really, really critical about how we understand deer, deer occupying this area and even deer evolution as some of these bones you can extract DNA from. You start piecing together this puzzle that's really complex about how mule deer, black-tailed deer, and white-tailed deer came to be. My mind just reels with the potential and the possibility of, of what kind of deer information is sitting down in, in all of these caves down here. It's, it's just mind-boggling. Multiple times, there's two benches up here and there's a big crossing. Multiple times I've seen bucks with their nose to the ground going across them. This is getting worse, it's not getting better. We can do the couple little hunts around here, but then we've got to go to another plan. Right. It's all, a lot of the time, wolf, it's all about prey vulnerability at that particular time, deep snow or whatever. Yeah. All right. 
back out to the road, back to the car where it's warm and there's Snickers bars. <laughs> One of the joys of being here is, is the hospitality that Jim and his wife, Karen, have shown. Every night when we come back, there's venison roast, there's fresh shrimp or homemade dessert. One of the other factors is the importance of Sitka blacktail, not only on the landscape, but the role that those deer have in filling freezers and the, what the, the value of that meat to the families of the people who live here. They don't buy meat. They take it from the forest. They fish different species of fish and shrimp and things like that. I barter for shrimp and halibut uh, with people that don't hunt deer. And so that's the way my wife and I put stuff in our freezer. When you shoot the deer once and you're reloading quick, how do you make sure you don't have some embers still in the barrel? Blow down the barrel. You blow down the barrel still. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, the bottom line is, if I've got everything laid out, it takes a minute. Mm -hmm. And that is a lifetime after you've pulled the trigger. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we're gonna go up here, go over the ridge, and drop into the big timber on the far side where we were two days ago and had called in a really nice buck. A really big four by four with eye guards. Spending a week on the island and hitting all of the different habitat types. We've been in, in this old growth, mature forest with closed canopy that I've read about and talked to people about. We've been in clear cuts with slash, second growth, um, all this muskeg uh, kind of habitat has been um, just incredibly valuable for me to give me this first hand foundation, not second or third hand information about about logging or about snowfall and all of these impacts have on Sitka blacktail deer. I do not believe he's going to come in today. Pretty in here though. It's pretty in here though. I don't have any more calls. I used everything. I don't know what to do. Actually, I do. Just keep doing what we're doing. <sighs> it was it was pretty obvious that the rut activity just has not picked up, and, and that probably explains some of our, our lack of success. Hunting and, and taking a game is really, really exciting, but 
it was the it's more the experience out there that you have on the landscape that I'm looking for. And we we had a great experience the last few days. All right, we will work our way through the timber stealthily, sneaking along the tracks of our quarry, unaware of our presence. Sneaky bite. They're gonna turn around and go, what is that? We called and called and called and hiked and hiked. I think we made actually about a three mile round trip back in there. So, here's what it is. We got a spot tomorrow. We're gonna check quick. That's right. As many as stars in the sky. <laughs> like a six day period when there's bucks all over the landscape suddenly. And so we were trying to catch that increase from very little movement to the in increasing movement this week. And maybe it was going on, but it wasn't going on where we were at. Just didn't, just, they just didn't cooperate with us, but that's okay. I think, um, you know, if we as deer hunters ever get this all figured out so that we know everything and nothing mysterious anymore, that'd be a sad day, deer or not. Um, it's just been, it's been a super time.